Okay, so uh, welcome. Today we'll talk about uh, two major types of uh, securing funding for, uh, for building your own uh, company. So let's start first by definitions so that we know what, what we mean when we say each of these two things. So bootstrapping is uh, self-funding a business using a personal resources and revenue from the business itself. So basically the goal is to start earning money as a business as soon as possible and use that money to keep on building the, uh, the company and the initial money you need to figure out from your personal resources. And in venture capital, I used a bit, let's say wider definition where basically it means acquiring external funding in exchange for equity and basically any rounds of investing. So seed, angel, early stage, late stage, I grouped it all under venture capital. So let's look at this uh, split by different types of venture capital a bit more closely. So basically, if you need a capital to build the product and service, what you need, the funding that you need is called angel or seed round. Basically, there are two, two subgroups. One is a pre-seed, where basically you just have an idea. You don't have a prototype, you don't have anything. So you just want to get this idea in front of your potential customers. You want to talk with people about it and maybe some develop the prototype, get some initial feedback. So if you need funding for, for that phase, then you need pre-seed funding. If you already have the prototype, you gathered some initial feedback, but you need to build a more mature version of the product, but still alpha, beta versions. And you need to prove product market fit, basically when you build it, that people will actually start using it, buying it and uh, relying on it. Then you need the seed round. If you have the product, at least the early version of the product, and you have initial feedback from the customers that everything seems good, then you need to actually build a company around that product or service. That's, that stage of funding is called early stage VC and basically it starts with series A. So this is, let's say, the official start of the VC round. And the money that you get in C series A is typically used to hire key people in the company, to build the full version of the product, to set up sales and marketing, to start, to start selling the product. Then we move further. Series B is basically you already have a working business model. You know how to sell this product. You know who your target customers are and you have the things up and running and you have the playbook for how to, how to go to market, but you just need to scale it out. And if this requires significant investment, then uh, this is called Series B investment where you take the money for scaling the working business model. And then <coughs> the last stage, late stage VC, is already basically preparing your company for, uh, for sale. So usually it means growing as much as you can and using entering new markets. So for example, if you have a, a service or a product which is geographically limited, entering into new geographies, buying your competitors, buying your suppliers, partners, key components that you're missing, making the whole offer of like establishing better control over the the product and service that, uh, that you are actually developing or entering uh, or developing a new product line that you will sell complementary with your uh, current product and services to the same customers and stuff. And basically after the late stage VC, you sell the company or you go to IPO. So that's the, uh, that's the typical funding, funding round, funding round. Okay, so why are we, uh, why are we talking about this? Uh, why, why did we choose this topic? One thing that annoyed me personally, and uh, I know that many people I talk to share the similar opinion, is, uh, is this, basically, people love stories about poor guy, but smart guy, risking everything, has a brilliant idea, he, he wins against all old odds, and media loves those stories. Why? Because like media likes whatever people like because they just need people's eyes to look at to sell ads. So media loves whatever people love. And then what happens is that investors realized this is really good for us because a lot of people are buying into these stories that they can get rich quickly. So there is a lot more people who are willing to work hard as crazy. We give them a little bit of money if they succeed, we, we get rich on this. If they don't succeed, it doesn't matter. We, our mathematics works. 
regardless if one of thousand succeeds. But from, from my point of view and from Jelko's point of view, we actually care more about these people who are entrepreneurial, who like to start new things, who like to change how things work. So basically we wanted to make this kind of uh, discussion here slightly differently than it's covered in media to help younger audience or whoever wants to start in this journey understand better what's in their best interest. So let's look at now at this, let's say, VC story. So the startup story, large success story. How, how is it typically portrayed, portrayed in media? So basically it starts usually with a smart student obsessed by an idea who drops out of college, works from his garage, eats ramen, lives on like mod, as modestly as he can, works 20 hours a day, large competitors, there's always some villains, uh, large competitors try to destroy him, but, but they fail, and then he succeeds and IPOs and becomes a billionaire and then is like a prophet for the next generation of the same story. How does this story look like from founder's perspective, like from the average founder who, who enters this same, uh, same story? Basically, he starts by having, like thinking to himself, I have potential, I have motivation, I have energy, I have an idea, why shouldn't I start this? But if, if we are talking about younger audience, uh, it's usually a student that, we, that, that I mentioned in the previous slide, he doesn't have any business experience, doesn't have industry connections, doesn't have capital. And I'm also saying always he, because in media story, it's always a male. It's almost never a, a woman who's, who's starting a, a startup in, in this, those stories. Then what he needs to do to get funding. He needs to first pitch his idea for a year, basically, to get the seed funding. So they say that typically, on average, uh, you need six to nine months of pitching to seed investors to, to get one of them willing to fund your idea. If you are first time founder, it goes up to a year. So let's say, uh, statistics says that roughly one in 100 pitches are f funded by, by VCs. So you need to make like hundreds of these pitches. But if you get funded, it's not that you succeeded, only then the real thing starts. Then you need to put your whole life on hold basically drop out of the college, forget your social life, and three to five years dedicate to completely to working on this, uh, to this idea. And along the way, your investors who, are, who were kind enough to give you money, on the other hand, are pushing you to choose higher, like if you, if you need to make a decision at any moment of development of this product or company, and one direction leads you to higher chance of success and the other leads you to a higher potential return if you succeed, but with smaller chances, investors will always put, uh, push you towards higher, uh, higher, um, higher exit, basically. Lower chance, higher exit, because that's the mathematics that works for them better. Because in, in your life, you need millions, but VC needs billions to make their mathematics work. And for you, billions would be nice, but it's better to have like, 40% chance at millions, then 3% chance at billions. And then, in order to succeed in these uh, like three, five, six, seven years, you need to become industry, business, and strategy expert. Like you started from college, you don't have any business experience, industry connection, or capital, but in order to succeed, you need to overcome all of this and become uh, expert in, in all of these things. And then, currently, the mathematics says that roughly, if you get funded, if you get seed funding, so this round, so if you pass this filter, if you get seed funding, you have roughly 10% chance to reach an exit, any exit. And then let's look at these exits. So median exit, in median exit, founder has 15% ownership in the company, so investors have 85, and the median valuation of exit is 40 million. So it's not billions, it's not hundreds of millions, it's 40 billion out of which 15% gets to founder. And that only means that a median value, so half of all exits are smaller than that, half are larger. So it's, it's, a, nice, it's a nice number, but you need to dedicate a lot, of, uh, a lot of your time and effort to do that. And now let's look at, let's say, the, what, 
how this situation would look like and what would be best if we take the founder's best interest as the main driving force. Like, what's best for this person starting this company? So basically, research, first of all, research says that we are not talking about the students. So research says that the most, like if you take all successful startups, the average age of a founder of a successful startup is 42. So we are not talking about kids. We are talking about people with industry experience and all, all these things that this student lacked in, in media stories. Looking at just the, maybe, maybe people will say, okay, but this is all startups, maybe all companies, but I'm interested only in these venture funded high tech startups. But looking at only high growth VC startups, it's even worse. The average for that is 45, so you need to be even older. There is a number here that I didn't write on presentation is that uh, the chances of a founder's success if he starts a company with six, at 60 years old is three times bigger than if he starts with 30 years old. And 30 is not 20. 30 is still 10 years of experience. So basically, here age uh, really helps, not just age by itself, but the, what you do with, with, those age, with that age. So let's look at now what's the, let's say, ideal company to start based on the, the research. I, it's ideal if you start a company in an industry where you are industry expert. So you are 42, 45, so in an industry where you are industry expert, where you have all the industry connections, potential buyers, partners, acquirers, so you, people know you. Uh, start at the time when you already developed management skills. So by 42, 45, you probably became a manager were exposed to organizations with more uh, mature management. So you already know things how to manage uh, larger organizations. And probably by this age, you also have some seed capital of your own. So you, need to, you don't need to run to investors for uh, pre-seed money because you can finance the early rounds of, uh, of your startup and maybe only later uh, raise money. So basically, here, this, the best interest in the founder is to bootstrap your entrance to entrepreneurship. Not bootstrap the company, but bootstrap the way how you start the company. So don't rush straight from the university. Don't jump into things that sounds cool, but is completely outside of your area of expertise or things that you worked on. So like, it's always bright, new, shiny thing that attracts people, but the chances of success are much better if you understand the problem and if you know the domain uh, much better. So let's start now. Okay, you decided to do, you, you are now 42, 45, uh, and you want to start a startup. You know which, uh, which industry you are uh, good at. So let's start by choosing an idea. So one thing that you heard probably many times is that ideas are cheap, ideas are everywhere, ideas are abundant, and they don't worth uh, shit. They don't worth, they're not worth anything. So it's all about how you execute them and uh, how much, how capable you are on turning this idea into a reality. So let's look at some ideas from the lens of boot, uh, how good an idea is for bootstrapping and how good of an idea is for uh, raising venture capital. If you want to start your company by bootstrapping and uh, drive it as long as you can in the bootstrapping mode, then some traits that your idea should have would be that Okay, it has low initial investment needs. It's much easier to start a software company than a hotel chain. Because for hotel chain, you need to buy or build the first hotel. It requires much more money than starting a software company where you need to sit down yourself and code something in whatever time you need. If, if your idea can generate revenue quickly, that's also a positive thing for bootstrapping. You, you never saw a bootstrapping company who, who went without revenue for 10 years and only then started charging, but you frequently see this with VC companies. Then two more things. Uh, it needs to have slow and steady growth model. For example, online games are not a good idea for bootstrapping because if you manage to make something that you really like, that which people really like, it's a big potential that you will like in two days get 100 million people. So basically there, there is a story saying before when you were launching a product, launching a service, your worst case was that no one comes. And then 
after this, after the internet and stuff, your worst case is that everyone comes at once. <laughs> so, so basically, yeah, this, if, you, if you can build a thing which has a slow and steady growth model, that's better. And also, if the market that you are entering uh, is such that you have flexible time, timeline for scaling up, what does that mean? That means that you are not at a risk of someone with much more money coming and taking all your lunch. So basically, buying the whole market. So you, some markets, like if you, if you do something that where there is a big potential of to earn money, you, there are in bigger chances that someone will come with more resources into this field. If you are in some niche, uh, small, and you expand from a niche outwards, you probably have all the time you need in, uh, to, to scale the company. But let's look at now from the venture capital eyes. So basically, when you are pitching an idea to investors, the typical investors, they are interested, is this idea, they're interested to know, is this idea a venture scale idea? What does that mean? That basically means that this, you are capable of earning $100 million per year in revenue and reaching 1 billion valuation within 10 years from him investing. So basically, he, he's only interested in these, uh, they're only interested in these big uh, potential returns. So what does that mean? So first thing that they will not want to know is how large is the total addressable market? So let's say, uh, I don't know what to, what to take as an example. If you want to start making those napkins now here, it's quite difficult to imagine that you will make a napkin which will, uh, like where, where your addressable market will be the whole world and whole sales of napkins. So maybe your, your total addressable market is Croatia and few surrounding uh, countries. And in napkin sales, it's very low chance that it's $5 billion. But if, for example, you are entering the, I don't know, everything in AI field now where the industry is uh, going and exploding and will probably become big, it's, it's much easier to, to have an idea which has this potential of addressing market which is 5 billion and above. Then the next thing is how you scale this idea. So you can scale everything, but VCs are only interested in scaling through technology. They don't want you, they don't want to fund startups which need to scale through people or assets. So basically, let's take this uh, hub 385 space. So if you are in renting space to flexible co-working conditions, like WeWork was, that was, not a good, uh, that was not a good choice for a startup because you need more buildings to, to scale. It, you don't scale through technology. The uh, co-founder of, uh, founder of uh, WeWork was lying a lot trying to pitch WeWork as a software company to hide this fact, but <laughs> that's, another, that's another story. Another thing is, instead of slow and steady growth, you actually need the opposite. You need to show that you can grow two to three times per year for years, like two, three, four, five years uh, for them to, uh, to invest. Not, not pre-investment. So this, let, just let me, make, uh, let me be clear. The, I'm not talking here about what you need to be already. They need to see this potential in front of you. So they need to know, can this idea scale and grow two to three times for next 10 years? Like, not that you build already scaled two to three times uh, per year for last 10 years. And one more important thing, you need to show them a clear way, if they give you $100 million, what you will do with them and how you will turn that into growth. So you need to show clear way to turn extra cash into growth. So you need to have everything else solved in the company, so you only need cash to, to speed it up. And of course, you need to plan for exit, because they are not investing for, for you to like, build a big company and look at it. They want to get their money back, and the only way to get that is to sell their stake, so there, there needs to be a plan for exit. But here, here is the one interesting fact. Uh, the title of the presentation is bootstrapping versus VC. So indicating that it's one or the other, but it's usually never one or the other, but both at the same time. But how? 
basically all companies start bootstrapping. Like at least for <laughs> at least while you are searching for this pre-seed investment, it's bootstrapped. You are funding your time your, with your personal resources. You are taking that time from someone. You are not getting paid for that. But then at some moment you you might need capital. At least some of the companies might need capital. So as we talked earlier. If you need capital to develop a product, prove product market fit, find scalable sales model, you need seed funding. If you solve that part, you have a product, you, you, you are selling it, but you need to scale all the operations, hire a lot of salespeople, and like enter ma the market more aggressively, uh, basically then you need early stage funding, so series A and B. And if you want to enter the new markets, acquire other competitors, prepare for IPO, you need late stage funding, so series CD and later. So basically the advice, which is commonly also the advice that all VCs tell their companies is delay, delay raising funds as long as bootstrapping doesn't increase your risk level. So like use your funds, whatever you have, beat your own or the VC provided as efficiently as, uh, as you can. So let's now look at the challenges which are slightly different, not slightly, but completely different if you are in the bootstrapping phase of your company or in the VC phase of your company. So if you are bootstrapping, the limiting factor for everything you do in the company is the capital. You don't have, you don't have that money. So one of the most important things is choosing your, what you focus on. You really need to work on the thing which can help this business grow the most. Not the thing that you like, not the thing that you enjoy, not the thing that you are good at, but the thing that the business needs. So choosing the focus and making sure that you focus all your resources on, on most important things, that's probably the most important thing when you're bootstrapping. Other challenges that you will write, uh, run into is hiring people. So when, when, you are, uh, when, you, when you're bootstrapped, you usually don't have a lot of money. You cannot go and hire the best sales guy out there. You cannot go out there and hire brilliant software developers. You need to work with the solid ones that you can find who are willing to, uh, like, basically, you need, you need to offer different set of uh, benefits, like better lifestyle or whatever, to compensate for them not working for companies which are willing to pay them much, much more. Like, I know, the, in the United States, Google, Facebook, and those are paying enormous salaries, but people still, some people still choose to work for much smaller companies uh, for smaller salaries because the lifestyle is, uh, is better and stability is better for, for them that way. And also you are limited to organic growth because like almost, almost all, um, Tricks how to grow fast require, require capital. So if we look now at the venture capital, so the challenge is here, is how do you hire and motivate the right people to join your company as fast as you can? How do you define and instill culture as fast as you can in a company which is doubling every like six months? So now you have 10 people in six months, you have 20, then you have 50, then you have 100, and two, like, in, Basically, every year, the company you work at is completely different than the year before. And you need to be the one uh, defining the culture and making sure that everyone adopts this culture and follows it in such a rapid uh, expansion phase, which is quite difficult. Also, it's on you uh, to, to define and implement scalable operation and processes, again, fast. I mean, it's not literally on you. You hire... You hire a leadership team to, to do that, but it's you who needs to hire those leadership team and you need to work with them to okay these kind, of, these kind of high level things. And you need to manage your stakeholders, like your investors, like it's your second nature. So like they need to be kept happy at every time. So basically when you go into venture capital phase, uh, oh sorry, then you need to lead all the things that like, you're in charge of everything. So marketing, sales, product development, technology, whatever. So in venture capital, the limitation is not capital. Limitation is you, <laughs> your capabilities. This one is much more uh, like 
how to say psychologically uh, demanding because you need to be you need to be aware that that you are the the main limiting factor in your in your company here you can blame whatever i don't have money i don't have better people here here you have everything but problem is you so <laughs> so that's the difference here okay there are some next slide is about risks which are specific if you take the venture capital because like if you if you go the bootstrap route you own the company you make all the decisions you you are the main ones but if you take outside capital it always comes with a small fine print and here is the most important and most relevant things so first of all if everything goes well for the company and everything then everyone is happy. You are happy, VCs are happy, all is happy, there's no small print, everything is great. But when it doesn't, their investments come with protections. And these protections, I wanted to highlight the most, most relevant ones, especially for the current uh, environment. So first one is uh, in case of down rounds. So down round is like, if you are on this... Uh, on this treadmill of raising, uh, raising new capital every one to two years. So at every, uh, at every fundraise, you get a valuation. Estimate that your company is worth X million dollars or tens of millions or hundreds of millions. And then on the next round, if, you get, if your valuation is larger than the previous one, it's called up round. But if for some reason your company is now estimated to be worth less than the previous, it's called down round. It doesn't have to be uh, your fault. It doesn't, everything can be nice and good for the company, but the environment can change. Especially now, 2023, second half, the environment changed. So even the companies who are going and doing everything as they promised, so everything is going well from the internally, the companies, their new round is down round because the risk appetite for VCs, the amount of money in VCs is much lower. And basically they're pushing all the valuations down and it's take it or leave it kind of situation. You don't have to take it, but you won't get the different things. So what kind of, what kind of uh, protection there are for these down rounds for investors? It's called anti-dilution anti provisions. Basically that means, let's say after a first round, you sold 20% of the company, you owe 80. And then in the next, you want to sell another 20. Usually these 20, the new 20 would come from Equally, like 20% of that would come from the previous investor share and 20 would come from your uh, share. But anti-dilution provisions help protect the previous investor. Basically, in the extreme situation, they remain with their 20 and you'd give the full new 20 from your part. Usually they, they don't do it like that, but still, I may, like they have some kind of partial protections. That's a typical statement in the contract. There is a there is a complicated formula to calculate it. I didn't want to go into such details, but in any case, what, what say, what, what's important to know here that in case of a down round, your, the share, like if you are selling 20% of the company, for you personally, it's more like 30% than 20. And for investors, it's more like 10, not 20. So they are more protected in these cases. They are giving up less of their part. Then there is a, strange uh, situation uh, with liquidations. So there is li there's something called uh, liquidation preferences. And one lawyery thing where IPO, uh, sorry, IPO is not considered a liquidation event, but selling of the company is considered a liquidation event. So there are some small footprints called liquidation preferences which usually when you are signing a contract, they sound like in case the company didn't succeed, investors have the first right to get their money back. Maybe you give them some extra, like some, sometimes they ask you for like um, to, to, re, to, to guarantee them return of at least like 100%. So they get two times money back compared to what they put into. But even at acquisitions, all their preferences, the investors' money gets paid out first, and only then from the rest you get paid. And then there is some kind of situations where they even say, we get paid first the amount that we invested, 
But then from the remaining, we get also our share. So they, there's like three ways how they can trick you in these liquidation preferences. And when, when you are signing a contract and everything, everything will be described when the company like fails, this is like, um, it, it already failed, so there is nothing much there to save. So you will be happy if you return the investor's money. But the problem is that acquisition, any acquisition is also a liquidation event. And 90% of all exits, including the big ones, are also acquisitions. So it's, it's valuable, it's uh, relevant. These liquidation preferences are relevant even in outcomes which are good for you, that investors take much more money there than... Uh, then their share would indicate. So basically what you would expect without knowing all these details. And then there are control rights. So usually when I was researching this uh, for the presentation, the one thing caught my eye with the seed round. So the most typical seed round is 25%. And 25% is very uh, like familiar to this 25% plus one share that we heard many times here in Croatia. Why is this? Because this, this gets you uh, veto power. So even without special voting rights, but sometimes if they, even if they take smaller cut, they ask for, for these voting rights. Basically, they ask for veto power from the seed round. What does that mean? That means that every major decision you want to make afterwards, hire a senior leadership, uh, raise next round, sell the company or something, they have the right to say no. And, if, and they have the right to say no. And they, they cannot push you to do whatever, you, whatever they want, but they can say no to things that you want. So that, that's, uh, that's the important thing. Basically, it's mostly limited to these company level events, like raising new funds, changing leadership, uh, selling of the company and stuff like this. So they can say no to any of these. And typically after series B, uh, investors completely control the board. Usually, sometimes it happens at Series A as well, but it's much more usual for ser uh, from Series B onwards. What does it mean when someone controls the board? What are the decisions that board makes? So CEO makes certain level of decisions, but board makes another level of decisions. And board, is this, uh, board makes the decision. Do we sell the company or not? Do we raise next funds or not? Are we replacing CEO or not? So these are the board decisions. And much more much more frequently than not. So investors don't want to do that, that they don't want to fire CEO, but they do regularly fire CEOs. And usually it's more related to series B and later, not so much earlier, because earlier they don't have better options than you. Like you are the one who came up with the idea, you are the one who are mostly involved in that. But once your idea is already in reality and you just need to make a business out of this idea, then they have much better managers than you to take over, and they are not afraid to, to use it. So here, uh, here I stumbled upon the thing that is completely new to me, and I wanted to share with all of you because like, since it was new to me and it's <laughs> interesting, I wanted to share the word. So basically there's, uh, there are alternative approaches to venture capital that are popping up now uh, everywhere around. So there are some founder-friendly uh, investors Basically, that's usually all, uh, former founders who sold their companies who are trying to help the future generation of uh, founders. So there is one called uh, the Com Fund, which basically says that they invest early in profitable businesses that want to maximize their chances of success and build for the long term. If you read more on their website, basically they're saying, we will never push you to take uh, like the riskier route with the higher payoff. We will always push you towards the the bigger chance of you succeeding, regardless of how big the success, success is. So basically, you, they are aligning their interests more with the founders. Then there is one accelerator, which is for software as a service companies, which is offering the mentorship community and funding, but without the pressure to go for $1 billion. So similar thing, they will not push you to go to the extreme valuation or give up. They will they are okay with you making a company of like 50 million, 100 million. For them, that's, that's perfectly fine, while others consider this a uh, loss of time and money. Then there are mission-driven investors, like this one here. Purpose, basically, 
if you care about the environment, if you care about uh, more women in, uh, in technology, if you care about whatever social or environmental or whatever thing you, you care, and it, they tend to fund startups with this kind of mission-driven uh, ideas, where the idea is not to idea is to actually make these things reality that you're talking about, not earn that much money on this. You need to earn money to survive. You need to earn money. The, I mean, company needs to be profitable to control its own future. So you need to become a profitable company. So they help you with that. But these missions are the first, uh, first term. And there is also another thing of financing, which is not venture capital, but more like a regular loans but they are based on, uh, on revenue. So they are called revenue-based financing. So basically, you, you sign a deal, you sign a loan where they give you some money and you pay back with interest, but your monthly payment are not fixed like uh, in, a, in a regular bank for, that you buy for your apartment, but it's uh, fixed as a percentage of revenue. So if your revenue grows, you pay more that month. If your revenue falls, you pay less that month. So it's like it's slightly better aligned with your uh, finances of the company, and especially for companies which uh, which have like un uneven uh, revenue. So, like for example, our company is software as a service, so our monthly revenues are quite stable. But for for some companies which are selling, I don't know, licenses or selling. Uh, uh, big big deals. So a lot of big deals are done at the end of the year. So I know some companies which were for which like more than half of the revenue is in December, whatever. So for them, uh, for them this is okay. So you pay most of your, uh, you pay back most of your loan in December, and rest of the months months you pay very very little. So these are like examples of uh, of new approaches. So it seems that more and more people are realizing that uh, the the typical VC goals and interests are not perfectly aligned with what's best for the founders and that there are other things which are important uh, apart from the just maximizing the returns. So let me now switch to, so this has all been like a theory or research or whatever, but let's switch now to a personal story of Jelko and me, like Tesdom uh, co-founders. So let's start first with Jelko. So during his education, he spent more than 10 years creating own software projects. He made, the, he made a 3D video game in, I think, early high school. Uh, he spent five years going to programming, uh, programming competitions. After he finished uh, university, he started working in Microsoft, where he was working on marketing and sales of developer tools like Visual Studio. Basically, he learned how do you communicate uh, how do you market and sell to developers or to technical audience? Then he moved to the United States to a company called Infragistics, where he spent a year creating developer components, like components that other developers use in, within their bigger project. And then he decided to, f to start up his own company called Gembox, where during these seven years of uh, running Gembox, <laughs> He learned how to start a business, how to sell software globally from Croatia, how, how to bootstrap all these small things. So this was Jelko's experience before Tesla. Yeah, and also one thing, this Gembox ended up being quite successful. So he turned enough money to live off and to finance a new startup. Let's look at my story. So during my education times, I spent 10 plus years going on programming competitions. Last three or four years of my university, I was actually creating tests for national programming competitions for high school students. Then I started working at Ericsson here in Croatia. In, I, I spent almost a year, in, more than a year in Sweden, more than a year in Japan. And what, I, what kind of experiences I got there? So first three to four years, it was more general business experience how large companies such as Ericsson works. I was working in technical sales support where I was exposed to these extremely large enterprise sales uh, deals of hundreds of millions, dollar, millions of dollars. Then two, two, three years, I was working in technical consulting with network optimization, where I, where I was trained and learned delivery and sales of consulting services. So it's not the same 
uh, it's not the same thing selling a product, selling a service, and selling a consulting. So like it's completely different uh, skill, skill sets. Then the last two, three years, we were basically starting a small, small company within companies called Intrapreneurship. And I started going into management, so people and project management. So that was my experience within Ericsson. And what, what financially on the side, I saved like equivalent four years worth of life expenses. But keep in mind that my lifestyle, even now, but then even more, was modest to moderate. It's not, uh, it was not like uh, I was not buying apartments, uh, driving nice cars and stuff like this. Uh, I was living slightly better than as a student. And let's now see Jelko and me together. So we met on programming competitions. And then many times later, after all this experience in uh, Jelko in Jambox and me in, uh, uh, in Ericsson, we both felt the problem of assessing developer skills as managers. So we had this problem. We were trying to, Jelko was trying to solve it in Jetbox. I was trying to solve it in Ericsson. How do we make sure that people who, we, who comes to interview knows what they're talking about so we don't waste five people, five people, so that five people don't waste their time interviewing someone who you see after three minutes that they don't know anything about programming. So, so basically, let's take in from these uh, uh, independent personal experiences. So what's the most relevant experience for this problem that I had? I had experience of creating programming questions for more than 20 competitions for high school students. And Jelko's experience was building a company which sells globally to technical people. So we co-founded Testdom, which is creating uh, like we create, create a database of questions and a platform to test software developers, which is pretty much similar to testing these kids on uh, com programming competitions. And we are selling this to technical managers around. So basically what Jelko learned in, uh, in Gembox. And how did we fund this? We funded this in a way that we made an agreement that we both work two years for free. And we uh, invest some profits from Gembox for the costs that we need apart, apart from this. So basically, uh, we chose Testdom uh, as everything we did before was preparing us for it. So as what I talked about earlier in the beginning of the presentation, choose the industry where you are expert, choose the industry where, where you have the experience, choose like basically we, we, we were not choosing any idea. We chose the idea where we had the competitive advantage over someone else starting that idea. Like, if you feel that for certain idea, you are a better person to do that, ex execute that than the others, that's the idea that you should work on. Not, not the one which sounds the sexiest to like your colleagues or whatever. So now, apart from our own personal story, uh, let me share a couple of successful bootstrapping stories. Some of them will, you will know, some of them will probably surprise you. So first is Infobip in Croatia. That's one you probably know. Infobip became uh, widely known only when it uh, raised the VC money because it raised an enormous uh, sum. But when, which, what funding did they raise? They raised late stage funding of $200 million at, rev at the time when their revenue was already $700 million per year and they were 14 year old company. So this is not a seed money young guys uh, asking investors give us uh, $100,000 to start a company. So they, why, they, why were they raising money? Because they realized we, need, we want to IPO, we want to go for IPO, and we need to make the company even bigger before that. So they decided to take funding and buy other companies in other markets similar to them to make everything system larger and prepare for IPO. Then is a MailChimp. Uh, do, you ever, uh, do you everyone know what MailChimp is? Yeah. Okay. MailChimp is a platform for sending uh, marketing campaigns via email, so mass emailing. So basically, e MailChimp was profitable from start and acquired for twelve billion dollars at at the time when their revenue was eight hundred million, so slightly larger than Infobip, and they were a nineteen-year-old company, and they never took any funding. So they, they didn't take any funding. So they grew this like from day one. But why? 
because they were profitable from the start. So their business model provided enough money every day that the money was not limitation for growth. So uh, other things were limitation. Then GitHub. So this one, is, this one surprised me when I was <laughs> researching because like GitHub is in the middle of Silicon Valley, started with Silicon Valley guys, uh, Silicon Valley story. But what happened with GitHub? GitHub was profitable also from start, raised 100 million at the time when they were already 100 employees and five year old company. So they didn't raise funding to build a company. They already became a company of 100 employees in five years, which is like extremely fast growth. Why they needed money? They took late stage funding to develop enterprise ready solution. What does that mean? They, so they started with github.com, so in cloud solution, but they realized that the big companies actually want all the bells and features of, the, of GitHub, but within their uh, intranet, so hidden from the internet, like kept private. So they needed to develop on-site version of everything they build in the cloud. So they took money, they took $100 million to, to execute that. Then Atlassian, this Jira uh, thing that everyone uh, hates or, or loves or loves to hate or whatever, uh, they were profitable from the start. And the funny story, they raised, at one moment, they raised $60 million at the time when they actually didn't need it. The, reason, they, the, the story is famous that it's most confusing uh, raising that investors ever saw. Like the company came and said, we want investment, but we don't need it. But like, why? They said that like no one believes us that we build this business with $60 million uh, revenue uh, and that we are now, we are trying to get a more professional board, some outside board members. We need to prepare ourselves for growth for IPO. But whoever we talk to doesn't take us seriously. How, but no, it's something suspicious. You didn't get any funding. So they said, we came for funding to, to be taken more seriously. And also, since we don't want to rush for IPO, we would like our employees who have shares and want to sell to get some money from that to be able to sell out early. So basically, they took 60 million and they didn't take it as investment in the company, but they actually completely take it, they sold it. So they allowed their early employees to sell their shares. So all the 60 million went to those employees to like start living rich lives because they didn't need that company. They didn't need that, uh, that money. So they wanted to build out their board to be taken more seriously. So they, they took the money just because everyone was expecting them to take the money <laughs> and they didn't need it. And then some other companies which were bootstrapped, Mojang, so Minecraft, all the way until sale to Microsoft was bootstrapped, Hotjar, Typeform, so these are European ones, all the way to MessageBird are European companies. So uh, Zoho, Patagonia, the mountain climbing clothes, Shutterstock, so basically, I don't know, I, I know all of these companies, maybe you know a couple of them, and it's actually surprising to me that how many companies reached either completely bootstrapped all the way to the sale or bootstrapped to some extreme levels of hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue. And then it doesn't really matter if you take, uh, if you take funding at, at those times. So basically that's it. The main, uh, the, main, uh, the main idea that I wanted to pass on is that it's not... It's not so much about bootstrapping or not bootstrapping. You always start by bootstrapping. You can even start bootstrapping before, like your process into entering entrepreneurship. So how do you, what do you do from your university time, from your life? How do you choose idea? Make sure that you choose idea where you have the competitive advantages over others. Don't do like, I don't know. I was pitched an idea. Let's make a chocolate chess figures uh, for people to, to buy and eat chess literally because like you take the piece and you eat it and yeah, that would sell us crazy. And like, why are you asking me? What do I have with chocolate? What do I know about that? What do I know about retail? I don't know anything. Like the only connection is that my son plays chess. So that's, that's it. So yeah, choose the ideas that, that are close to you where you have the network, where you have, uh, where you have the skill set 
And at time of this age, not at the student story uh, that media usually says. There was even a, there was an article even explaining about uh, famous uh, garage stories for Bill Gates that like Microsoft's growth actually started happening when Bill Gates reached 35. Uh, Bezos, uh, Amazon growth started happening when he reached 37 or something. So they started these companies when 20, but they were like not, not going extremely successfully. So even they made the biggest breakthroughs when they became more, more mature and more uh, knowledgeable about how things uh, work. <laughs>